So today's not any different. Everybody say yay. yay. Everybody say yay. yay. <laughs> We're going to talk about more sacrifice today. Oh man, yay. That's right, Sue. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to the book of Genesis, the 22nd chapter in the book of Genesis. And it's the story of Isaac. We know Isaac. Genesis 22. Everybody okay? Okay. Verse number one. I don't know how this is taping, Sam, because it's very close to my head. It's all right? Hopefully it'll be, well, yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, we'll keep the volume down, that's all. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. Now let's talk a little bit about that. If you don't know much about Abraham, oh, I'm telling you, what a great story. So Abraham is uh, in Haran, H-A-R-A-N, and that's where he was at the time that the Lord first spoke to his heart. Abraham was not a uh, Hebrew. He was nothing at that point. There was no Hebrew children. There were, he was just a guy. And the Lord speaks to him. And the Lord challenges him. You can go back to Genesis 12 if you want to read about the calling of Abraham. And Abraham responds to the voice of God. The Lord says to him, listen, come, follow me, and I will make you uh, a great nation. And your descendants will be as many as the stars in the sky or the sand on the beach. Abraham didn't hesitate, and he picked up his stuff. By the way, Haran is Iraq today. Abraham picks up his stuff and he says, that's it, I'm following God. And he and Sarah follow the Lord. And he takes them through a variety of different places. Now, you know the story basically about Abraham, I think. I don't want to bore you, but let me just say it for those who might not know. Um, The Lord promised Abraham and Sarah a son. And it wasn't happening. It may be because Sarah was 95 and Abraham was probably a few years older than that. But he did promise, God did promise that he would have a son. So like any person that we know, well, yeah, the Lord said it, but I've got to do it. So he takes a handmaiden, Hagar, and together they have a son. But it wasn't the son that God had promised him. And Ishmael uh, grew uh, within the campsite, and Hagar, the uh, servant, uh, raised her son. But then one day the Lord said to Abraham, Ishmael has to leave. You have to separate yourself from this son. And And Abraham knew he had done wrong, that he didn't believe God. He tried to do it on his own. And you know, I have to tell you, church, whenever we try to do something on our own, whenever we step out and say, well, we're going to, I'm going to do this. The Lord spoke to my heart that I'm going to uh, uh, be a pastor of a church. And so you go out and you get some brick and mortar and start to find a piece of property. You're going to build a church. But if God didn't tell tell you that you were supposed to do it that way, Everything you're doing is for waste. There's no gain in any of it. But we continue to try to do things our way. It's our own mental status thing. It's our own pride. And so we end up messing up so many times. And we, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I don't think so. Many times we wake up and we look around and we go, how did I get here? Ever been there? Oh my goodness, I'm in such a mess. How did this happen? Well... It wasn't God that put you in the mess, (laughs) you know. So Abraham had to uh, 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 had to separate himself from Hagar and Ishmael. They left, and shortly thereafter, Sarah became pregnant with Isaac, and um, and so this was the son of promise. Abraham's son Isaac was the son of the promise of God. 
And they had a very close bond. They loved each other. Abraham praised God for this son. Loved this son. And now we're in chapter 22. Now it came about that after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, here am I. And he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. I got to tell you something. Pastors don't like to preach this story because of everything that's going on in our head right now. So what's going on in our head? Why would God do that? Isn't he supposed to be a loving God? Isn't he supposed to be a uh, our father? Why would God tell Abraham to do this? Why in the world? Do you know, uh, many times things happen in the world and we're asked that same question as Christians. Why? Why? I can't understand it. At least in the story, in chapter 22, we get a little understanding. It says that God tested Abraham. That's not fair. (laughs) Well, yeah, well, guess what? He's God. He can do whatever he wants. But God tested Abraham. And he tested because he knew how much Abraham loved his son. And perhaps, and there's no Bible for it, but perhaps Abraham had started to worship his son. And you know, you parents, we we know, you love your children. But that love should never supersede our love for God. And perhaps that happened. And so God wanted to test and remind Abraham about his love of of God. And so, so the Lord says three things. Take now your son. Not somebody else's son. Your son. The thing that you love the most, Abraham. Take your son. Your only son. Whom you love. It was a challenge for Abraham's very core. It was a challenge on everything that Abraham knew. He said, take your son. Your son. Your only son. There's not another where you could say, well, well, Isaac will be gone, but I'll still have Joey. You know. No. Your only son. And yet there was a promise. Go and take him. And, uh, and go to the land of Moriah. And after there, as, uh, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. He's telling Abraham he's going to offer his son Isaac as a burnt offering unto God. Uh, you know, God has never asked us for a blood sacrifice of a, of, of a human. That was the sign of, of the pagan gods, Moab, and they would offer human sacrifice. God never did that, never, never, and has never done it from this point to the New Testament when he offered his own son, Jesus Christ. But he, but he challenges Abraham. But I'm interested in the response of Abraham. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And they split wood rather for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. Abraham didn't, didn't even flinch. Didn't even flinch. Didn't ponder why, how come you're supposed to be my God. There was no argument there. Now understand that Abraham had his ups and downs with God. We know that. We know that he lied about his wife, saying that she was uh, she was just a, 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 a cousin, not his wife, because he was scared for his own life. He um, had other times when things were up and down with the Lord, but always God was there, and always Abraham ended up 
realizing and repenting and acquiescing into the, 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 uh, unto God. So Abraham rises early in the morning, doesn't hesitate. Obedience. I want you to do this. Yes, Lord. Oh. Would we at not at least hesitate a little? Oh, my goodness. If God told me to do it to my dog, I think I might hesitate just a little. But then there are times I wouldn't hesitate at all. But <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> So, <laughs> so on the third day, there's a time element there. And we don't hear anything that Abraham is, is fighting God on this thing, but it's three days. Um, on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, uh, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood uh, of the burnt offering and laid it on, the, on Isaac, his son. And he took his uh, hand, uh, I'm sorry, his hand, and the, and the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked up together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, uh, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? How that must have... (sighs) Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place where God had told him and Abraham, to Abraham to build the altar there and arrange the wood and, by, and, and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the wood, on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. There's no exchange there. Probably too painful for an exchange. He stretched out his hand took the knife to slay his son. There was no hesitation. I will tell you that when things happen in our lives, we question and worry and fret about things sometimes. And I'll tell you primarily because we are lacking in an intimate relationship with Almighty God. See, his whole life from the time that the Lord first called him, Abraham walked with God. Abraham laid his life down and walked with the Lord and made mistakes, but walked with God. He knew the Lord's voice. He knew what he was calling to, to, for him to do. He heard this. And so there was a relationship with God. Abraham knew God loved him. Abraham knew God had called him. Abraham knew, in fact, because he knew the voice of God, that it was God that said, bring Isaac. So how could he hesitate? He had built that relationship over the years, and he had failed many times, and yet he followed after God. And so he's here now, and he's there, and he raises his knife to slay his son knowing in his heart how much God loved him and how much God loved Isaac. And so in obedience, he raises this this knife above his own son. But, now you all know the story or have heard it, but the angel comes. Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. And again, it's not in the book, but I got to tell you, could you imagine the relief on Abraham's face in his heart when the angel says, when the angel says, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham says, here am I. Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your only son from me. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Abraham just kind of, I, I see him almost falling down at hearing that. Because it took everything he had probably to raise that knife. And then the Lord took that from him and he fell. 
Ah. Assured once again of God's great love. In verse 13 it says, Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked and beheld behind him uh, a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Mount Moriah. I, I want to just share a few things uh, with you. This story that actually happened, of course, but this story is a foreshadowing of the New Testament. The fact that the Father would bring Jesus to lay his life down. And at that point in time, we know there was no other sacrifice that could do the same thing. Jesus had to die. It was in, in, in the New Testament we realize the great sacrifice that the Father had. We read about Abraham, but we see it in, in the Father in the New Testament. As Jesus carried his cross, as Jesus climbed Calvary for us, do you know if there was not one other person on the earth, he would have still died on that cross for you? For our forgiveness of our sin. There was no ram in the bush. He was the ram in the bush. He was the Lamb of God who laid his life down. No one forced Jesus. It was an act of obedience unto the Father. The same way Abraham, in an act of obedience, is ready to go the extra extra distance for the Almighty God. Jesus offered himself. Offered himself. Knowing full well what it meant. In our, our Bible school class that we're doing on Wednesdays, our Bible study, uh, we talked a little bit about last week about how in our life it's wonderful to know God, but it's even more wonderful to be known by God. And that's really what we're talking about here. It's good that we know God. Those of us that have uh, accepted Christ and as our personal Savior and we walk committed to following the Lord and, and to being uh, his witness on the earth, we uh, know God. We have had an experience with Almighty God. Now, we don't know everything about God, even though sometimes people think they do. We don't know everything about God, but we know God. We know him personally, the same way Abraham knew the father. It was a personal relationship. Nobody had to tell Abraham. Abraham knew because the Lord and he were so close and so tight. We have that relationship right now with Almighty God. That as we decrease, he increases in our life. And so we don't have to yell. We can whisper and and our head is on the Lord's heart. We're that close to him. It is a personal thing. He knows what we're dealing with uh, with us. He knows what, what we're crying about on our pillow at night when nobody else knows or on our way to work or our way home from work. Nobody knows. We carry on like business is normal and yet there are times when our heart is breaking and we can't share it with anyone. We don't even know how to share it because it's so deep, the hurt. Some of us have been betrayed. Some of us have been made a fool of. Some of us have been taken advantage of. And the hurt is so deep that we still, but we can't share it. It's buried too deep. And we're afraid that something will happen if we start to to bring it out. There will be a flood of all of the hurt and pain of our lives. But God, in the quiet of our private room, when no one's around, and when when at that point where you go into the bathroom and lock the door and you begin to weep, but you don't want the kids to see you upset, you begin to cry, you don't want your spouse to see you that way, that the hurt is starting to bubble over. God knows. And God says, Come, I got this. I got this. 
We think we suffer alone, but we don't. We think our pain uh, can't be can't be given to anybody, can't be shared with anybody, but yes, it can. Almighty God in His wisdom has provided a way for us to do that. See, the whole thing, you know, we get caught up in why this wasn't fair. Why, why Isaac? Why Abraham? None of that matters. We're talking about. Our obedience unto the Lord. You know, as we walk more in the in the way of God, the more we walk in Him, God begins to increase those those times of obedience that we need to have. But when we first started out, there was such joy in our life. And God would ask us certain things to do and we'd be like, yeah, I'm doing it, Lord. I'm going and talking to that person. Oh, yeah, Lord, I'm driving, you know, uh, two hours every Sunday to go hear, <laughs> to go hear that crazy lady in East Adam. You know, it was like, yeah, you know. But you see, as life goes on, that first love that we hear about at, from the church of Laodicea, where Jesus says in the book of Revelation, I have one thing against you. What happened to your first love? See, in order to, for us to maintain that first love, I got to tell you, you know, husbands and wives, I have to tell you, in order to maintain that first love, that when you were first going out and, oh, he's so cute, she's cute, you know, those kinds of things, you have to spend time with your spouse. You have to spend time with one, with the one you love. Parents. If you want that relationship to your kid to last a lifetime, you need to start spending time with them and making time. Sometimes I know it's hard, but that sacrifice that we give up to spend time with our family will pay off for for the whole generation, for years to come, decades to come. I want to say to you that that is exactly the same thing that happens with God. The more intimate we are with Him, the more we share things in our lives that that we wouldn't share with anyone, the more we continue to look to him in the middle of our crisis, in the middle of our stresses, in the middle of times when we don't know who to turn to, but we get away some place place and just go to God. There is something that happens in our whole in our soul and in our spirit. There is a lifting of our person, who we are, not because of some mumbo jumbo or whatever. It's the fact you're in the presence of God. And listen, when you are, there's nothing else except He will lift our head. He will I- encourage our hearts. He will reaffirm you and let you know that what you're going through is only temporary. There is a light at the end of that tunnel. He will, listen, you may not believe me, but I'm telling you, you can believe God. What you're going through will not last forever. Those that endure for a night, but what comes in the morning is joy. I want you to know to get through that hour, those times of darkness, those times when we don't know what we're doing, with the times when all of a sudden you like, all of a sudden you're drowned and you're going, wow, this one got mad at me. I'm getting in trouble at work. This person is telling lies about me. And it's like all of a sudden you can't do anything right. I don't know about you. It's like, you know, just trying to get some air, you know. Oh my goodness. God's got you. And if, if you spend that time with him, you will actually get to know God even better. And the most important thing for us is that we are known by God. We're not in some cosmic consciousness over here. God knows us. He knows every hair on your head. That's what it says. Do you know that? Yeah, that's what it says. It says he knows every hair on our head Jim. (laughs) Or lack thereof. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And more importantly, Jim, he knows you by name. That's the other thing the scriptures teach. By name. So not only do you know God, he goes, oh, wait a minute. 
Jim, what is that, Jim? What are you saying? He knows you by name. (sighs) So when you're feeling the most forgotten, you have not been forgotten. The Lord is standing right by your side, encouraging your heart. But you see, it doesn't happen by magic. And, and you know, you have to really hear this because um, I deal with people who are um, who have been Christians for years and have become embittered. And, you know, I'll say something like, um, well, how's your prayer life? <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> When's the last time you talked to God? Uh, well, uh, it's been a while. What happens with us is that he is jealous for us. He loves us. He wants us to be with him. He will move all everything off of his schedule, Almighty God's schedule, so that he will be there with you when you come to him. But we don't come. And so we look at things humanly and uh, with a material eye rather than a spiritual eye and a, and a revelation knowledge of God's love. We talk about God's love every Sunday. Every, every church in this town probably talked about God's love today. And yet so many people don't believe it. I loved Heidi's uh, praise report today. Ben, uh, you came in a little bit late. I, I, oh, I didn't mean to sh- mention your f- failings before the whole church. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> but Heidi, 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 I told you, Heidi mentioned you. And how she said, and God brought Ben. <laughs> you see what happens? You know, Ben said to Ben told Heidi, Well I woke up this morning and the Lord said to go to Chestown. Can God tell you to do something? Are you hearing him? Are you close enough to hear the voice of God? Have you been with him enough so that you know the voice of God and the voice of the tempter and the enemy of our soul? Do you know sometimes uh, sometimes we hear the voice of God, sometimes we hear the voice of us with all of our baggage that we carry. God told me to do this. No, he did not. You know? God uh, uh, showed me this. No, he didn't. That was from your heart. That wasn't from the heart of God, you know? And then, of course, the enemy would sound like God to us. That's why it's so important that we know the voice of God. To know and to be known. That's the call of our lives. Because, you see, it doesn't matter what the test is. What matters is our obedience within the test. What do we do while we're in the middle of it? Somebody cut you off in traffic. I I wish I was in your back seat. (laughs) Let's see how that goes. Um, the other day, there's a, an elderly woman I know, very sweet, and uh, uh, I think she's 87 or so. And you know, and she's like, "Well, Dolly," she calls me Dolly. "Well, Dolly," you know, and she's so sweet. And she was talking politics, and she said to me. If this if this guy got uh, if this guy gets in, she said, and then she used some language I haven't heard since I was a probation officer. I mean, from this little old lady, she was, you know, using just you don't even have to think about it. Just take my word for it. I went like this. Have a nice day, Dolly. And then she walked away from me. I was like, did I just did I just hear that? And you know, my, my point in it is that as you can, you can look like a Christian all you want. You can carry the biggest Bible Schofield chain reference under your arm, you know. You can do everything right. But unless your heart is changed, you're not gonna, you're not changing. Some people say to me, uh, I've heard, you're not like other preachers because uh, you just, uh, you just say what's ever in your head. And, <laughs> oh, really? Um, <gasps> 
but what they're trying to say is that you know you're not I, I'm I try not to be I try not to be something I'm not I'm a sinner saved by grace that's all I am and I'm not going to put on a phony facade or, because you know I'm a preacher or whatever it, we have to be real we can't do that any longer that phony facade that the, uh, that the world gives we should have nothing to do with that so that yes sometimes a, a, a Christian can fall and something can come out of their mouth and wow where did that come from but the, the still the fact is that their heart is for God and so that as we get closer to God we don't have to worry about sin because God takes care of sin and the language or the, the actions of our lives become become more reflective of who God is that we would all be real. How will the world know how to come to God unless we're real? Sometimes I worry about that. You know, we get in churches and and we're all holier than thou. Oh, well, you know, praise the Lord. The Lord showed me that. And I just bless your heart. That's all I wanted to say. I wanted to just come and just tell you that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. God bless you. And before they even get out into the car, they're having an argument with their husband, they're beating their kid, they're, you know, running people over in the parking lot. I can't stand that. And I don't think God can either, to be quite frank. People need to see the real you to understand the real God. I had a call in my life when... You would have thought, believe me, he's calling her. She has a relationship with Jesus. But I'm telling you that the world will not know the way unless we're where they are. Jesus became man so that he would be an example for man, so that we would see how it's done. And we would have an example of how to get through the tests and how to get through the trials. We, we see him, you know, uh, being arrested, brought before Pilate, then before Herod, then back to Pilate. We see this happening and we're saying, but he's God, but he's suffering as we would suffer. We, last week we talked about, uh, denying ourselves, picking up our cross and carrying it. And following him. That's what our call is. There is a trial. It's not, it's not when, it's not if, it's when you get tested. Understand that how we go through it is everything. We can go through it in obedience, worshiping God, still not understanding it, please. We may never understand it because our gray matter is so small. In our, in our tiny, peen, weensy, peensy brains. I mean, we're trying to understand God of the universe with this brain of ours. I don't get it. No kidding. You're not supposed to get it. I'm God. Right? We try to, oh, well, why, why? It doesn't matter. What, mattered, what matters is how we are going to go forward. You know, This life we have is not for cowards. It's not for cowards. And and no matter how much you may try to avoid it, if you're really a blood-bought child of God, you're going to experience difficulties. It's the way of life. The scripture says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. So you're just, you're going to have as much rain as, uh, uh, as anybody else, as any heathen out there. But we go through it worshiping Almighty God. Amen? Amen. I want to just, uh, I just want to read this to you. Um, Karen Watson, uh, was, uh, a missionary, uh, uh, in Iraq. And she was martyred. And, um, when they found out that she was killed, prior to her going to Iraq, she gave a letter to her pastor. And, uh, on her death, he opened the letter and it and this is a quote from the letter you should only be opening this letter in the event of my death when God calls there are no regrets 
I tried to share my heart with you as much as possible, my heart for the nations. I wasn't called to a place. I was called to him, Almighty God. To obey was my objective. To suffer was expected. His glory was my reward and his glory is my reward. And then she said, care more about some, um, care more than some think is wise. Risk more than some think is safe. Dream more than some think is practical. Expect more than some think is possible. I was called not to comfort or success, but to obedience. And that is his call for us today. That last paragraph, care more than some think is wise. Care more. People say, hey, you're going a little too far there. Care more than what some people are wise, would think are wise. you got to watch yourself. They could be taking advantage of you. Don't worry about that. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Care for people around you. They don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. Remember that. That is so important. Nobody cares that you know where Obadiah is in the Bible. I found that out. <laughs> I never could find Obadiah. They don't care about that. But when you're there and extending a hand of encouragement, bringing a bag of groceries, helping watch their kids, that's what speaks to their heart. And it says, uh, risk more than some think are safe. Ooh, you're going to do that? Mm, that might not be safe. So what? If God has brought you to it, he's got the answer for your life. Risk more than what some people think is safe. And dream more than some people think is practical. You will never. Anybody ever told that in their life? You're never going to, you're never going to amount to anything. You never. You know, I had teachers say, you're never going to get out of high school. (laughs) Never. That's why I never took Nellie's physics class. Because I figured if I wasn't getting out of high school, why would I need physics, right? People have told us all our lives that we couldn't do things. People didn't have the vision. Because you know why? Because the vision is your vision. It's yours. God gave it to you. People don't, they're not being mean. They're not trying to put you down. But they don't have that vision. You've got the vision. And by the way, Vision doesn't end, you know, when Social Security kicks in. Vision goes on for the rest of our lives as Christians. There's always new vision. There's always a refreshing vision of God. There's always an encouragement just to take the next step, even though we may not have a clue how to get there. Just take the next step. That step is easy. Just take the first thing that God tells you to do. And know that he's in it. He will lead you where you need to be. He will equip you for the things that you have to have. And even in our lives, when we go through the difficulties and the stressors and the suffering of our lives, we will get through with the attitude of Christ. This afternoon, well, it's not quite this afternoon. This morning, I want to just encourage us. Me too. That as we go, we go with God. For the Lord is with us. He watches over us. We don't suffer alone. And we can face anything. Anything. We talked about the martyrs. Today's martyrs and some of the countries that are having to go underground and complete villages are just um, devastated. And, and yet, God is there. If we believe and trust him. He will take care of us. No matter what the future holds. The Lord loves us. Amen. Let's all stand.